So I'm not an economist, I'm an educator. And I'm an educator who likes to ask questions and who cares very deeply about the future of this planet and of future generations on this planet, not just humans, but all species. And uh, I have a very old dear friend in Polly Higgins. We um, both lived in North London together and we've known each other for about six years. And as some of you may know, Polly is somebody who's leading uh, an international campaign to make ecocide the fifth crime against peace. And that would be a crime tried in the International Criminal Court in The Hague alongside crime site genocide and acts of aggression. And Polly and I, um, I knew Polly before she even thought about ecocide, but for a long time we've been having conversations about how do you make um, game changes? How do you make things that shift systems so much that the conditions that prevailed in the past no longer prevail in the future? How do you change people's imaginations so that they believe that they can really um, create a different future on this earth? And while Polly has been operating at a very high level, at international law level, and talking to um, governments around the world, I've always been much more interested in communities. What's the role of communities in making change happen? What are the kind of ideas that we've lost hold of that we can recover? Maybe the commons is one of them. What are ways in which we can look at indigenous peoples around the world and see ways in which they've been, been dispossessed, in which they've lost their voices, separated from their ecosystems and their territories and no longer have agency? Is that something that we can see happening here? Perhaps it's happening here in a way that we can't see. And so uh, through asking all these questions, um, I persuaded Polly to come and run a short course with me at Schumacher College last January called Voices for the Earth, a local response to ecocide. We weren't really teaching, we were asking lots of questions. We had some ideas about what we wanted to, to bring to the course and Wendy was there, so afterwards she can give us an idea of what actually happened because it kind of passed in a blur. But what we knew needed to come out of that was a process and a document and we didn't know what the process would be or even what the document would be but we spent time during that week looking at tools that we could pick up and use, things like environmental impact assessments, or things like the Aarhus Convention, the UN Convention that was signed in Denmark, which says that all communities have to have a say in any development that happens in their territory and that will affect their local well-being and their ecosystems. And we knew there were things out there like um, Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund in the United States that had been working since about 1995 to make it possible for communities in the states to create their own bills of rights. And uh, in fact, in, um, I believe it was in 2000, in about the year 2000, it was Pittsburgh who was the first um, community in the United States to enact their own bill of rights. And that was in protest at fracking and they created a frack-free zone. And so we were very inspired about what they were doing, and I'll come on a bit later to more detail as to what they were doing. And we somehow knew bills of rights didn't resonate here in this country. We wanted to find something that was much more resonant, and we wanted to look back through English history to find what that might be. So in the national interest, we have so many things competing now in this country, in any country, it's very difficult to say what is in the national interest. Is it in the national interest to keep shale gas in the ground, or is it in the national interest to exploit it and to frack it? Frack it? Is it in the national interest to um, put a lot of water into fracking when we need so much water for agriculture and for just human consumption? Is it in the national interest that fracking fluids may um, leach out into our water tables and may affect groundwater and then be brought up into the soil and will affect farming, not just human health, but animal health. What really is in the national interest? And I feel very deeply that now is the time when we need to get much more savvy about all the things that are going on so we can get a real handle as to what is in our national interest. So we're at a time in the history, not just of the UK, but of the earth, when so many different things are competing. So we have oil exploration threatened in Virunga National Park in the Congo, which is Africa's oldest national park. I mean, how could this happen 
in a place that's so important and so beautiful and so full of biodiversity? What pressures are making it possible for um, great corporations to come in and for the government of the Congo to say, yes, we give you permission to go and explore the gas? And we know all over the world that ecosystems are under threat from climate change, that it soon may be possible to mine for oil and gas in the Arctic, for instance. We know that um, things are happening in the Amazon that we would rather not see happening, where whole tribes are being dispossessed of land because land is being taken over to grow, um, to grow um, food for other nations, but also to produce uh, vegetables for um, creating fuel. So we have a lot of pressure everywhere and we need some kind of new thinking. Not the thinking that solved, that created the problem in the first place, but a new kind of thinking that really is imaginative and takes us to a new place. So in this talk, which is about the national interest, we're going to, going to down, delve down into what's happening in our locality. We all believe in the power of community because we live in Totnes and that's why we're here. And this talk is about the power of community to create change. Asset mapping is something that I'll be describing as we go through the talk. It's really coming back to what do we value? What are the things that are important to us? And if we map our values, can we then see what our assets might be and how a community could step forward to enshrine those values in some kind of document and to step up to the plate and make sure those things that they value are maintained for future generations. EIAs or environmental impact assessments, we've come up with a radical new definition which is being supported by the EU which is that environmental impact assessments need to include cult culture, and that's where ecosystems and human beings come together. Participatory planning, that's kind of not such a new idea, really. That's how the commons were governed. But the idea that we may have more of a voice, potentially, than we have at the moment. The communities could really become participants in the whole planning framework. Reviving the commons, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's important to go back to our origins here and to draw on past... Um, processes and ideas, things that are part of the fabric of our history. And making a community charter is what this talk is all about. So I've talked a little bit about the trouble with ecosystems, that everywhere they're under pressure, and that the tragedy of the market is that we, um, we see ecosystems as being resources and commodities. We look for what individual gain we can get out of them. We no longer see them as being part of the fabric of our lives. We maybe have even forgotten how important it is that healthy ecosystems are needed to underpin our well-being. I think we take a lot of um, what happens in our ecosystems for granted. We assume that water authorities are doing the right thing, that all the agencies in a watershed are connected up and they're talking to each other and they have the best interests of the community at heart. I think for the most part they have, but they don't necessarily include the community voice in that. So we have uh, the tragedy of the market. And how might you describe the tragedy of the market? So uh, let me see, I had a very good um, quote here, which I seem to have lost. But the tragedy of the market is obviously in opposition. It's a reversing the tragedy of the commons. The tragedy of the commons was a concept that was put forward in about the 1960s by... Um, somebody called Garrett Harding, who said that the tragedy of the commons is that common pool resources are always managed to destruction because the people who are on the commons don't take care of the communal interest. They only think of their own interests. So through overgrazing, for instance, they destroy what it is that supports their livestock. And two uh, contemporary academics called um, Weston and Bollier, Burns West and David Bollier, are arguing that the ancient institution of the commons may help us counteract the tragedy of the market. And they, um, they talk about the tragedy of the market as being the way in which unbridled pursuit of private accumulation is abusing human rights and destroying our environment. We're going to look at Falkirk and the way in which Falkirk have created the community charter that I've um, pinned up on the wall over there. But White Cleave Quarry in Buckfast Lee is another example very close to home where a community saw that the um, potential damage to their local environment and their local community was so great that they needed to step forward and to do something about it. And we welcome Catherine Hughes from Buckfast Lee who might say more about that 
um, afterwards, and we're very thrilled to report that the planning adjudicator has overturned the, um, the application to dump toxic waste in White Cleave Quarry. And Communities as Stewards is really all about the Charter, what the Charter is about, and it's also the concept that was behind the Buckfast League Community Forum stepping forward and saying we need to take action here. So I'm going to tell you the story of how Falkirk made a charter. So um, at the time when Polly and I were teaching the course at Schumacher, we had no idea what was going on in Falkirk. But what was going on was that a community was waking up to the fact that for the last 20 years, unbeknownst to them, an energy company called Dart Energy, no relation to our Dart, I don't think, I think it's Australian, had been prospecting, prospecting for coal bed methane. Coal bed methane is um, not dissimilar to the kind of gas that you find in shale. So the process that's used to extract it is not dissimilar to fracking. It's a little bit different. Coal bed seams are closer to the surface and they're full of water. So it is a slightly different process. But the impact on the environment is very similar in the sense that toxins are released that go into the air and into the water. You get gas rigs all over the countryside. You get lots of heavy lorries moving about and it becomes a very unpleasant place in which to live. And so uh, in Falkirk, about nine months ago, the community was getting together and they very intelligently put together what they called a community mandate. And in the community mandate did, went a lot of scientific evidence about the damage that coal bed methane extraction would cause to their community. And the community is a very interesting one. It's quite a new community. It comprises people who are um, grandchildren or children of, of of people who lived in that community not so long ago, at the time when that was a highly industrialized landscape and the place was being mined for oil, uh, for coal rather. And as you probably know, Falkirk is roughly between Edinburgh and Glasgow, and it's on the Firth of Forth, not very far from Grangemouth, which is where 40% of oil and um, is processed, crude oil is processed to make petrol and other products that we use in this country. So it was an old industrial area that had been rebeautified. All the coal mines had been filled in. The waters were once again full of salmon. There was, um, there was greenery, and it was very different to the way in which communities had lived there in the industrial e era. And so the, these new um, immigrants, if you like, were returning to their home place. They were promised by the housing developers that their children would be playing in bluebell woods, and they would be entering a, peace, a place of peace and tranquility. Well, they woke up with a shock when they discovered what Dart Energy was proposing to do, because Dart Energy was even proposing to drill underneath the new homes, and they would be um, surrounded by a landscape which would take them back to the area of industrial industrialization. So they created this community mandate. Um, in it was a lot of very cogent reasoning as to why coal bed methane extraction, extraction was not a good idea. And they put two visions into their community mandate. And I'll read them out to you. Our vision, one. Our community under the full council structure and local plans is happy, prosperous, and healthy. We're envied for the quality of our air, water, and natural surroundings and our thriving, sustainable local economy. Visitors and our children want to live and work here. We've achieved this future through care for and restoration of our natural environment and investment in leisure and tourism, sustainable industry and agriculture and renewables. Our vision too. Our community, if the current DART proposal goes ahead, is depressed, poor and affected by smog and sickness. Our landscape is peppered with rig flares, our outdoor access is inconvenienced by continuous industrial traffic, and our air, groundwater, rivers and streams, farmland and natural surroundings are contaminated. Nobody wants to live or create businesses here anymore. Many of our children have moved away to find a better life, and there is doubt that Falkirk local authority can ever fully recover its lost reputation. Those remaining are unable to sell their houses, get affordable insurance, or find desirable jobs. So it was at that stage that um, Polly Higgins connected with somebody called Jamie Mackenzie Hamilton, who lives near Falkirk, and who'd helped them create the mandate. 
and they were able to have a conversation and Polly was able to tell Jamie that we had been um, proposing to come up with a charter or some kind of document that would help communities exactly such as Falkirk and that we should all start talking to each other. So I've also talked briefly about community bills of rights in, to, in the United States. And um, the inspiration that they've given us. Now, like the Charter, community bills of rights are not legal documents. They are mandates that are voted into existence by local authorities. And they are, um, in the case of community bills of rights, they are asserting local democratic control directly over corporations. And they're changing the status of natural communities and ecosystems from being regarded as property under the law to being recognized as rights-bearing entities. And as I said, over 100 communities in the United States now have community bills of rights. And we are now talking to CELDF, the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, with the idea that the group that I'm part of now, the Community Chartering Group, becomes the UK arm of what they're doing. And this kind of joining up, I hope, will continue to happen with communities around the world. The rights of nature. Many of you will know that countries like Bolivia and Ecuador have put rights of nature in place in their national constitutions. And we're picking up on that idea and putting it into the charter with the idea that um, all beings and ecosystems have rights and those rights need to be taken care of and represented in any participatory planning process. The first thing that happened with Falkirk is that um, three of our team, including Jamie, um, offered the opportunity for Falkirk residents to come and do an asset mapping workshop. And it was conducted as a World Cafe exercise, and they were posed a number of basic questions, which I'll let you know in a minute what they were. And they were invited to map tangible and intangible assets. Now, tangible assets are the obvious things that are included in neighborhood plans, which are things like um, our, our local houses or our, um, our local businesses or anything that's to do with things that can be valued and measured. Intangible assets are not exactly the same. They're much more to do with well-being and values that you can't measure. But through asking basic questions and looking for shared values, it's possible to surface what these intangible assets are. And the overriding importance of working out what these assets are and coming up with a kind of shared vision of the future around values becomes evident when you start thinking about the importance of agency. What agency does a community have in this particular territory? What does it believe in? Well, if it has a charter in which it's set down everything that it does believe in and value, it's much more able to represent itself and to go into a process with a, um, a, whole, a, a developer or local authority to set out the future they would like to see. So this is what happened when um, the workshop happened in Falkirk. So these basic questions were being asked. What do I enjoy about living here and why? What are the local places in the landscape that are important to me and why? When I was considering buying a house here, what did I picture? What would we like our children to in how would we like our children to enjoy this place in 20 years time? And coal bed methane production here in Falkirk is a concern for me because. And these were all open questions that were inviting a shared conversation. And underneath those questions, there were sub-questions. For instance, obviously when they were considering buying a home, they had a particular picture because the developer had given them a picture about welcoming communities and about bluebell woods and swans on the Firth of Forth. And this was something that they were referring back to and they wanted to assert their right to have that future that they had been sold. And so we asked things like, how important was the natural environment to your decision and why? And do you, do you see yourself living here permanently? And if so, what aspects of a place are essential to considering permanent residence? And under, how would we like our children to enjoy this place in 20 years time? We asked things like, what types of green spaces are there? And how will a sense of community be maintained? What kind of job opportunities are there? What kind of leisure activities are there? 
And out of this process came a concern, four overriding concerns, with one that was even greater, the fifth one, which was greater than the other four. And as you can see from this slide, having looked at all those things that they valued and wondering about how they were going to protect them, they realized that they could distill what they were concerned about into four things. Cultural, cultural instability, no peace of mind, ill health and environmental harm. I don't know if you can read from the back what it says in those bubbles, whether you'd like me to read them out. Would it help to read them out? Okay. So under cultural instability, they're saying, loss of reliable foundations on which to build our homes, families and shared legacy. And under no peace of mind, worries we cannot escape from, even in the sanctuary of our homes and favorite places. Under ill health, sickness afflicting us and our loved ones and reduced quality or length of life. Under environmental harm, destruction of the natural systems upon which we depend for stability and well-being. But overriding all of these, they realized, was this powerlessness that they felt, our lack of agency over things we know to be fundamental to our health, well-being, and prosperity. And so the Charter was, in a sense, being born through these workshops. We didn't really know what the Charter would say, we were very concerned that it would come from the mouths of the community, that we weren't imposing language on the community, that it needed to come from them. And we were very interested in what they would consider their rights and responsibilities to be. And here you can see what we essentially came up with and what became the framework through which we started to devise the Charter. And I just wanted to read out the, um, the very beginning of the Charter to you. And I've also printed the charter out and I've stuck it on the wall there and you'll get a chance when I finish talking to go and have a look at it before we sit down and do a Q&A session and, and do a further discussion about the charter and whether it has any relevance here. So this is what the charter says at the very beginning. A community charter to establish the cultural heritage of the concerned communities of Falkirk and to declare our light, rights and responsibilities for its improvement and, and protection. Declaration. We, the peoples of Larbert, Stenhouse, Muir, Torwood, Earth, Shield Hill, and California, the concerned communities of Falkirk, have produced this charter as a declaration of our basic rights and responsibilities for improving our cultural heritage and safeguarding it against coal bed methane extraction and other risks in the future. We declare our cultural heritage to be the sum total of the local tangible and intangible assets we have collectively agreed to be fundamental to the health and well-being of our present and future generations. These constitute an inseparable ecological and socio-cultural fabric that sustains life and which provides us with the solid foundations for building and celebrating our homes, families, community and legacy within a healthy, diverse, beautiful and safe natural environment. This is the basis of a true economy, one which returns to its root meaning, oikos, meaning home, nomia, meaning management. Thus, this charter pertains to any development within our territory which impacts on our cultural heritage. And as this charter is a direct expression from the people, it must be a material consideration in planning processes and decision-making, is a factor for impact assessment under environmental legislation, and must be given equal weight to other factors in the evaluation of whether development is sustainable. The basic right to self-agency. So the basic right to self-agency is in a way um, tied in with the whole democratic process and the whole idea of participative democracy. So in declaring a basic right for the peoples of a community to have agency over those assets in its territory, for well-being of both present and future generations, it's saying that there needs to be some participative process through which communities can be at the table when developers come in and request permits or licenses to extract or to build in that territory.
These are some of the assets that um, the people of Falkirk decided were important and which went directly into the Charter. Our goal of a clean and safe environment, our children and that which promotes their wholesome development, the resilience of our community, our vision of a truly sustainable local economy, our local historical and natural attractions, a collective commitment to sustaining and improving all of the above. And all in all, there were 16 assets which they named, which were not contested. I mean, these are values that any community would hold dear. And they named the sum total of the community's assets to be cultural heritage. And this is important because um, the assets are not separate. They're together they form an integrated whole, which is greater than the sum of its parts, where each part plays a vital role. Neither this whole nor its parts can be reduced to categories, environmental, ecological, cultural, economic, and so on, because none of us experience the world in that way. In our lives, all these threads are intimately in intertwined. The things we value, pride in the past, hopes for the future, that which sustains us, our families and our community, an inseparable, irreducible fabric, which we have termed our cultural heritage in the Charter. So in a sense, we are redefining what sustainability means by bringing cu cultural heritage into the notion of what should go into an environmental impact assessment or what should be in the local, in the national planning framework. And whilst um, in the environmental impact assessment that the local authority in Falkirk and DART Energy put together only looked at cultural heritage from the perspective of tangible assets, which are basically national and protected monuments, the current environmental impact assessment EIA directive from the EU is quite different. It distinguishes between material assets and the cultural heritage and acknowledges that the latter can include qualities like community cohesion and identity. The Council of Europe Framework Convention defines cultural heritage as, I quote, a reflection and expression of constantly evolving values, beliefs, knowledge and traditions, which includes all aspects of the environment, resulting from the interaction between people and places through time. And this EIA directive is in the process of being amended by the EU. I don't know if any of you have heard in the news last week that there's a recommendation from MEPs to include in the new EIA directive the fact that all um, exploratory fracking as well as fracking needs to have an environmental impact assessment and as part of this whole review of environmental assessment is the idea that cultural heritage is a part of what's integral to the environment. So we, in the, in the national planning framework, there isn't really a hard and fast definition of sustainability. So we've taken the opportunity to define what truly sustainable development is. And we're saying it means any development in our territory which is found to represent an overall long-term benefit or zero harm to our assets. And in this photograph, you can see Angus MacDonald, who's the local um, MP, MP for um, Falkirk, who's a Scottish Nationalist Party MP, receiving a copy of the Charter, which he then took to um, the Scottish Parliament at Holyrood and presented to his party. So how do we achieve the vision of the Charter? Well, we're saying our direct expression becomes a material consideration. And because it's a, an expression from the people, it needs to be part of the planning process and a factor for impact assessment under environmental legislation. And we're also saying that environmental impact assessments need to assess the effect of any project on our cultural heritage as, as expressed through the Charter. Secondly, we're saying that the precautionary principle has to be a basic test for any development that happens in our territory and this is part of the, um, the EU directive as well. The precautionary principle has to be exercised. Another way of talking about the precautionary principle is first do no harm. If you're unsure as to whether what you're going to do has any harm, it's far better not to do that. 
and participatory planning is also a key way in which we envisage the charter being implemented and in the voice of the community becoming part of the process. Government-led initiatives have tried to ensure developers involve communities more in the pre-application stage, but the experience of the people in Falkirk was that those initiatives were not successful. They weren't truly consulted. And so we're proposing in the Charter something called participatory planning. And to give you some idea about how that might have worked with the first coal bed methane application in the local authority, what would have happened in Falkirk is that in the pre-application phase, a potential threat would have been evident because a new industrial process was, in, was involved. At this point, an independent and impartial body, and not the applicant or the agent of the applicant, would have been tasked with conducting a consultation. This body would have identified and recruited representatives of relevant stakeholder groups, including the local council, community council, residents, businesses, the developer, the natural communities, i.e. the representatives of those local ecosystems and the natural beings in those eco ecosystems, and any other relevant third parties and expert consultees. And this body's aim would be to invite dialogue and the impact of the project on the community's cultural heritage as expressed in the Charter. And together, this group would have brought in the way we envisage, would have been responsible for reviewing the application and evidence of risk. And if issues remained unresolved at the time of application, this body would be responsible for mediating the conflicting positions and possibly stewarding agreements and conditions to resolve them. Because we believe that the wisest and fairest assessments of risky developments, developments are always best achieved through collective decision making. And we also recognize a tendency to underplay or completely disregard the wider impacts of local developments, the vital importance of local biodiversity to our community's resilience, and the limitations of human knowledge. So the Charter would have reminded us that these needed to remain a consideration in group discussions, and to ensure that everyone was equally engaged and heard, and requirements met, the independent body would have been responsible for, for facilitating all meetings negotiating group consensus and reporting outcomes to the council and other relevant public bodies. And the outcome of these participatory planning sessions would have been a material consideration for local and national government when making decisions whether or not to grant planning permission. And this relates to the declaration that any decisions emerging from participatory planning are a material consideration because our people, any community, bear the burden of any risk to themselves and to the natural environment. So uh, what has happened in the three or so months since the Charter was launched in Falkirk? Well, this is um, a photograph of Falkirk Local Authority where the charter has been adopted by at least half of the councillors. The charter has a significant ever-rising number of local residents and farmers backing it, and um, adopted by the local community council, representing a population of 18,211. That's the community council of Larbert, Stenhouse, Muir, and Tor Wood. And it's generating wider interest, political, media, legal, and public interest locally from the growing number of communities at risk from the dash for gas. And uh, just recently, last weekend, a group from Falkirk presented the charter at the local, at the, at the national rather, SNP conference. And out of that have come requests from organizations like Planning Democracy for presentations about the charter. And what is ultimately what this the Charter has done for Falkirk is to uh, bring a community that was against, very much against, coal bed methane extraction because they could see how very damaging it would be into their community and to the local environment and to their future. And it's turned the whole situation around because within the Charter they've envisaged something that they are passionately for, which is a very different kind of future. So I would like to kind of bring this talk to an end by going back to the Commons. 
So as I said at the beginning, we knew that the whole notion of community bills of rights would not have a great deal of residence in this country. What really resonates for us here are charters, the Charter of the Forest and Magna Carta. But even before we had Magna Carta, we have the Code of Justinian from 535 AD, who talks about something called res communes, or things that are held in common. And he, the Code of Justinian says, by the law of nature, these things are common to mankind, the air, running water, the sea, and consequently the shores of the sea. The right of fishing in the sea from the shore belongs to all men. And the Justinian Code distinguished res communes from res publicae, things which belong to the state. And then moving on to Magna Carta and the Charter of the Forest, at the time of um, the visit by the barons to King John at Runnymede in 1215, there was talk of a lost charter. Even at that stage, there was this notion that there needed to be a new charter that was implemented for, for England. And um, what happened subsequently to our Magna Carta being promulgated was that this lost charter, the Charter of the Forest, was rediscovered. And in 1225, the Magna Carta and the Charter of the Forest were reissued as a combined united charter, which um, collectively was called uh, Magnae Chartae Libertatum Angliae, the Great Charters of English Liberties. The Magna Carta, as you all know, was an effort to curtail the grasping behavior by which King John was annexing forests for hunting and riverbanks for fishing without any concern for traditional rights to land. And Magna Carta effectively protected the interests of the church, the feudal aristocracy, the merchants and the Jews, and it acknowledged commoners, it assumed a commons. It would be wrong to think that Magna Carta was a charter that was protecting the commons. It was really, um, in a way, documenting the rights that were already there, which had been diminished, and it was putting a line in the sand and saying, these common rights need to be upheld. And just to give you an idea of what was in the Charter of the Forest, because I think it is very relevant when we think about the community charter that we're talking about today and the idea of community stewarding ecosystems. So, for instance, in the first chapter of the Forest Charter, there, it's the, the, there was a, an ordinance saving common of pasture for all those accustomed to it. The seventh chapter forbade foresters or beetles from taking sheaves of corn or oats or taking lambs or piglets in lieu of a feudal tax called scotal. And the ninth chapter provided adjustment, the pasturing of livestock and panage, the pasturing of pigs to free men. The thirteenth stated that every free man shall have his honey. The fourteenth chapter said that those who come to buy wood, timber, bark or charcoal and carry it out in carts must pay chiminage or road tax. But those who carry wood, bark or charcoal on their backs need not pay. And there was also something called estovers, which was particularly for widows who were able freely to go into forests and into fields and to glean. And wood at that time was ubiquitous. It permeated the life of every aspect of, of Europe at that time. It shaped um, the economy, it shaped the architecture of the buildings, it literally underpinned the culture. And we've forgotten how much our own culture, our own economies are underpinned by the natural world. Also, we can look at the work of Eleanor Ostrom, who wrote a book called Governing the Commons, which won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2009. And she did a very um, brilliant looking at um, the ways in which different common pool resource systems had been managed historically and how they were being managed, managed in contemporary United States. And her conclusion was that given the right circumstances, it's possible for the commons to be governed well. I mean, she was obviously challenging the tragedy of the commons. And that government of the commons is usually done best by the local community that are stakeholders in the common pool resources. And today we might say our common pool resources are things like our air that we breathe, our water, our ability to have good food grown on healthy soils, and to have good forests as well. And in general, for our ecosystems to be in a state of good, of good maintenance. Ostrom rejects both the might of central government 
and moving to private ownership of solutions. She advocates support for communities in problem solving and conflict resolution and suggests that it is vital that the system is policed by its users. She observes that systems that are not working well lack predictability, information and trust, as well as having high levels of complexity and transactional difficulties. The ability of groups to modify their governance systems, which may date back many centuries, is the only way to ensure they are sustainable. So we've looked at um, the commons as an activity, a process. Commoning was only kept alive by people who went onto the commons and asserted their rights. In the charter, the community charter here, we're saying sustainability is a process, that people have to take part in this process in order for our environments to become truly sustainable or for development to become sustainable. And we lay out ways in which communities can participate in that process. We invoke the rights of Mother Earth, the idea that communities are speaking for the Earth, that all beings in an ecosystem need to have equal weight and equal consideration when developments are being looked at. And I also like to invoke the commons of the imagination. When so many parts of our lives are enclosed, we still have the ability to imagine a different kind of future and to take action on that. So I just want to end with the question as to whether if we were to make a charter for Totnes and the local in places around Totnes, what would we value and want to protect? What is our long-term vision? Transition has given us a way to imagine our long-term vision. It hasn't yet been put into a charter, but that could still happen. And what are our tangible and intangible assets? Could these, for instance, go into our neighborhood plan? Neighborhood plans are so much about tangible assets. We should be thinking about the intangibles as well. I've put there the, um, the website for Falkirk. If you want to go and look at the charter online, it's there. But also, if you want to be emailed a copy of the charter, please come and see me, and I'm very happy to take your email and send you a copy. And just to let you know that um, the group that created the charter has five people in it. We are um, scattered around um, Britain. We're in Scotland, Wales, and, and England. And we are developing workshops that will take this charter out to other communities, such as Balcombe, for instance, in Sussex. And we're very interested to hear from communities that want to create their own charters and are happy to come and work with you on that process. So that brings my talk to an end. Thank you very much.